Hello again. This is Dr. Harriet Fraud with my podcast, Capitalism Hits Home. Today, we're going to go over part two. Both parts deal with the intersection between personal life and categories we may not have ever thought of around personal life, like class and race, but also gender and everything else, because personal life is shaped by and also shapes everything else around us. We hope to reach you, to help you make sense of what's happening, to help you see that things you thought were your fault are actually social developments, and to help you get along in this capitalist USA. Last time, what we did was we looked at class. We looked at the five class systems that exist in the world. Slavery, and then feudalism, capitalism, socialism, and communism. And we looked particularly at feudalism, because feudalism is an economic arrangement that really did define American white women's position from the earliest days. And that is because women worked in homes owned or rented in the name of men, and they worked to create all sorts of services, use values, cooking, cleaning, creating order, creating an aesthetic environment, sexual services, emotional services, childbearing, childcare. And for that, they had a share of the male's income. In the 1950s, when men from strong union efforts, for which they sacrificed, managed to make family wages, they could well support or decently support dependent women and children at home. Before that, although people were poor, women were dependent on the male, were either dependent on the male wage or worked for very inadequate wages to supplement what was an essentially male wage, the only wage that could support a family. Now, still, women were earn 82 cents on the man's dollar. And women's earnings have been set way back as we have been pushed back into all the domestic labor in our homes. Because although feudalism is, has been eroded, women still do the overwhelming majority of cooking, cleaning, creating order, child care, sexual services, emotional services, and social services in the home where there are men and women. However, that system of feudalism in the home never existed among black families because black men were never paid a family wage that would have supported dependent wives and children. Black women almost always, of course, these are big generalization, not every single person fits this category. But black women had to work outside of the home to either supplement their man's income or support themselves and their children. And so that they had a far more independent and less feudal standing in their families. In the 1970s, feudalism was transformed, and what was really a class revolution, the only one we've had, happened in the United States. Because what happened was, thanks to jet travel, international speedy communication systems, mechanization, robotization, computers, jobs that had to be on location 
could be shifted overseas to places like Bangladesh, India, China, where people make a tiny fraction of what Americans earn doing the same job. So, for example, a good wage in China, and China is the most prosperous of these countries, is $3.50 an hour. That would hardly be a good wage in the United States. Plus, these countries do not have the kind of ecological restrictions and work restrictions that we have in the United States. And so capitalist companies who really don't care about where they are, as long as they can keep making more and more money, outsourced American jobs overseas. Millions of well-paid jobs were shifted overseas where companies didn't have to pay health care or pay attention to ecology and could pay their workers peanuts and give no benefits. That was allowed because we don't have strong socialist and communist parties that would have forbidden it the way they did in Germany, the most prosperous of the European economies, or all over Scandinavia and largely in France as well because their powerful socialist and communist trade unions and parties made outsourcing illegal. In Sweden, if you want to stop producing something in Sweden, you have to get every single worker that works in your enterprise an equivalent job. And that's so hard that companies will then decide to produce something else rather than try to close down a factory, and they're forbidden by law to outsource. But we didn't have, you know, our left tradition was smashed in the 1950s, and America was so prosperous then that Americans let that happen. They tried that after the war in Germany and France, but since the resistance was led by the communists in those countries, they couldn't quite smash it, even though the United States, on the Marshall Plan, didn't allow them to put communists in high positions in order to get the money from the Marshall Plan. And so the communists, for example, in Germany, by and large, went into the union movement and helped making, make it a really strong union movement. But in the United States, the communist movement was largely crushed. And so that they could get away with the kind of capitalist ascendancy that allowed them to export millions and millions of family-waged jobs to cheat to countries where they could make even more money, and then, of course, come back with their billions and buy the American democracy, pay for representatives, congresspeople, senators, to do their bidding, lobbyists, and so on. However, a revolution that was hardly a revolution happening in the economy in the United States started happening in the United States in the 1970s as millions of well-paid, often unionized jobs were exported overseas and labor was cheapened, and capitalists in the United States could exploit workers because a lot of their union colleagues didn't have jobs, and unemployment was so enormous, and the communist and socialist parties were crushed, so that women, won't women, had to join their black sisters in the labor force outside the home and work outside the home as well as within it in a kind of feudal arrangement that no longer worked as well. Because if you work outside the home in a capitalist enterprise, you might be less energized and willing to come home from your day of work to do the cooking, the cleaning, the childcare, and the social connecting and emotional connecting for a man. And therefore, women 
opted out. The old joke is the joke that a woman is dragging some reluctant man to the altar. Now it's women who most often refuse marriage because they don't want to be married to somebody who wants them to do all the domestic work and child care and sex work and also have them work all day. They're not willing to be in a fascist feudal family, although they are pushed by many religions, as I spoke before in the podcast. To do so, they're much more reluctant. And so that now, for the first time in American history, women are the initiators of divorce. 70% of divorces initiated by college-educated women who are more likely to be able to support themselves, are initiated by women, that's 70%. And over 60% of women in marriages who are, where they are not college educated, initiate divorces. And I should say that the 50% divorce rate we now have in the United States is double what we had before, you know, in the 60s, before these jobs were exported. It's double, and it's at 50% is the official divorce rate. The divorces and separations that go through the court system. But for millions of Americans who don't have children where they're fighting over who gets custody or don't, want, don't fight over custody and who also don't have enough assets to fight over, just split. and. They don't go through the courts, which is expensive. They just split. And that's at least 15% of the divorces and separations. So we have a majority of people who are divorced and separated. And two thirds of those people wouldn't be divorced and separated in the economy of um, the 1940s and 50s. And so that even though U.S. women make 82% of the male dollar, they're opting out of the feudal family. Even though there are many religions that urge them to serve men, Southern Baptists, Evangelical or Orthodox Catholics, and Hasidic Jews, they opt out of those strictures. Now, in the household, no one profits monetarily. No one makes money from someone else's labor. However, some people get all these use values in the old days. You know, men got cooking, cleaning, domestic labor, sexual labor, emotional labor, social services and just used a portion of their wealth to maintain a household. Now a burgeoning family form, actually the majority family form for women in the United States, is the independent household, where women live alone, or they live with themselves and their children, and they provide their own emotional labor and their own Domestic labor, cooking, cleaning, creating order, they socially, their social labor of connecting who they want to, with whom they want to, and maintaining their children's lives, their child caring labor, they perform that themselves. Now, nobody measures gay families, so it's unknown how many of these families are families of which they consider roommate families. And that would be another category, are gay or not, that's just not known. However, the majority of women now live in what are independent households, where the domestic and emotional and social labor is done by themselves. That's a revolutionary class change. There's another change. And that is the ideal of a communal family. 
That's the family form advocated by most marriage counselors. It's a family form that is truly communal from each according to his ability or her ability to each according to his, her, or their needs. And that means that men and women try to share everything, what they get from earning in the workforce outside the home and the labor within the home. That is still an ideal that isn't widely practiced, but it's an ideal that is a communal or communist ideal. For the first time, that is out there as an ideal family. It's a revolutionary communist family. It's taken a hit lately because in this recession, over a million women have been laid off and unable to work. And women who are in the home have suffered quite a bit from domestic abuse because they can't go out and work and because they can't escape their households. And we'll have to look at, okay, what's going on here? Well, one of the things that's going on that is a direct result of class transformation in the household are some of the biggest struggles in the United States over issues that weren't as big in the 1960s or early 70s or even late 70s. And those are abortion rights, accessibility to birth control, accessibility to sex education, the Me Too and Time's Up movements. Those are all the struggles around women's feudal position versus women's communal or independent position. Because without abortion rights, women are trapped in child-bearing and rearing roles from which there's very little escape. Children take enormous amounts of time and energy. And for a woman to have a child and not to have a lot of money to hire other women to take care of her child means that her career ambitions and her life possibilities are severely curtailed. So that the struggle for abortion rights and against abortion curtailments is really a struggle that says, are women basically carriers for male children? Are, women's, are women sperm carriers to produce offspring rather than free citizens with control over our own bodies? Are we sexually the possessions of men as we used to be before? And Me Too and Time's Up are similar. They're saying just because we're women doesn't mean that we have to serve you, serve men sexually, and that men have exercised a feudal privilege by commanding women's services. It's indicative of that, that the worst rates of sexual assault are in male bastions. The military, male gangs, of course, like the health angels that advocate male supremacy over women. Administrative jobs, which men used to hold, and now women are increasingly trying to get into. STEM fields, science and um, math, technology fields and engineering are places where women are sexually molested and accosted more than they are otherwise. Another is manufacturing, which used to be a male stronghold and now threatened males want to exercise their privilege their feudal privilege by commanding women's bodies. So that if you look at graphs 
of what are the fields and the areas in which women are most often raped or assaulted, they are formerly all, mom, all male areas. NRA membership is one. Well, the NRA has a target where you, uh, called the ex-girlfriend target, where you can shoot the ex-girlfriend so much that you can blow her to bits in a bloody mess because she refuses you. Even the issues of mass murder, which are really numerous, I only kept track between April and May. There were 45 mass shootings. That's 30, 45 mass shootings. I mean, 45 mass shootings in 30 days, more than one a day. And they were all male, and they were all men who lost an emblem of traditional feudal masculinity, a job that could support, ostensibly, women and children, or a girlfriend, or both. And these men asserted their masculinity and their importance in a masculine way, like the NRA advocates, through the mouth of a gun. That there is still a strong protest against the loss of feudal ascendancy of men. A client of mine did an interesting experiment that illustrates that. After the January 6th insurrection attempt of the Trumpians to go into the Capitol and take it over, I guess, or at least do a lot of destruction, she put an ad in Christian Mingle, a Christian dating site that said, wanted a real man, a real true man, a masculine man who will not be constrained by anything, even the government. Send a photo. And from the photos she got, she matched them up with insurrectionists at the Capitol and sent 22 men's names to the FBI because the appeal of the feudal ascendancy of men over women and that definition of masculinity inspires, I am a man, I don't have to obey your laws. And I worship Donald Trump, who has 27 sexual assault allegations against him, and who brags about grabbing pussy. These are feudal remnants of men trying to assert feudal ascendancy in a changed gender landscape in which women are demanding the absence of sexual assault, sexual equality, control over our own bodies, rather than leaving that up to male control in the family. Job equality. All of those things can be seen as part of struggles against a feudal destiny based on gender. We have to remember that if you were born a serf, you had to have a kind of marriage to the Lord, where you swore fidelity and service. You swore fealty, faithfulness, and service, just like you do in a marriage, where you love, honor, and obey according to the traditions. That all of that is now up for grabs. And it's ironic that it's up for grabs because the capitalist desertion of the American workforce that was demanding reasonable wages and benefits. That is a contested terrain in the United States, contested through all of the birth control constraints, the abortion constraints, the sexual behavior contests, and also through gay and transgender rights. Because one of the things that doomed women to domestic labor in the household was the ideology that your sexual assignment means 
a biological destiny to serve men and children. Just as if you were born a slave, you had to serve the Lord. If you were born a woman, you had to serve the Lord of the manor with your husband and his children. That if you start allowing people to make gender choices, to change the gender that they were sexually assigned at birth, as in transsexuality, or be sexual with someone who isn't the binary, but is the same as you in a homosexual or lesbian way, then you are changing the terrain that destined women to serve men in feudal households. And that's one of the reasons that the Republicans have all of these rules about which gender can use the bathroom and whether you can discriminate against gay or lesbian or transsexual or bisexual people or people with a binary sexuality. Because if sex is serving, is a destiny to serve or a destiny to control, then you can't have people making a choice other than their sexual gender assignment. You can't have people deciding to desert that binary of male and female with its destinies. And so that struggle too, which is a very dominant struggle in many communities, particularly in the American South, where all sorts of rules have been passed that discriminate against transsexuals or gays or binary sexuality or sexual choice and all sorts of conversions like conversion therapy, which is a kind of therapy that tries to force gay people into liking opposite sex people because it considers that this is of the devil and must be controlled. Because what would happen if people's sexuality didn't doom them to a social role? What if it didn't doom women to bear men's children and take care of men, do the domestic work and the emotional work and the sexual work and the social connecting? What if those roles could be chosen or changed? Then the feudal household has no basic ideological premise. Because the ideological premise is you are a woman, therefore you are destined to this role, as they say in the Southern Baptist Convention on men and women. Women are to be subordinate to men. Or like they say in the Catholic tradition, women are to be in charge of hearth and home. In other words, cooking, cleaning, childcare. Or they say in the Orthodox Jewish tradition that the man every morning thanks God for making him a man in God's image and thanks God and a woman thanks God for making her born in his, with his opprobrium, his disapproval as an inferior destined to serve. These are the struggles we're having now, whether it's gay rights or transsexual rights or birth control and abortion or Me Too and Time's Up. These are struggles around the feudal household. I hope you react to this program. I hope you give me your feedback. It's brought to you by Democracy at Work. And I want to thank Lou Phillips, Maria Carnamola, Brian Issam, and to the whole team at Democracy at Work. Thank you. Goodbye for now, and please give me your comments.